the second macromolecule I want to focus on in this chapter are the proteins and uh, they actually are probably the most important of all of them in the structure and function of a cell. Not, a, not an accident that a lot of the processes that you and I'll talk about with regards to development at some level there are going to be many proteins involved and uh, the other three macromolecules are generally there just for support and tools that the proteins are going to either sort of be part of or live on or work on and so the, the proteins themselves are very versatile as we'll see if you think about their structure they are macromolecules by definition they are polymeric meaning that they have some kind of a subunit structure to them subunits in this case of course are the amino acids and whereas DNA and RNA had four building blocks that go into making them part of the versatility of proteins is the fact that they have actually 20 building blocks that can go into different proteins so the combinations of 20 different building blocks is really quite a bit more versatile than just the four the 20 amino acids are going to have the same basic amino or basic structure that is part of where their name comes from the amino group and then the acid group attached to this central carbon and those two amino and acidic properties are then unique to all of them and then each one's going to have its own unique R group that give it its individual properties similar to remember all the nucleotides had a sugar all of the nucleotides had a phosphate but the the base that they had GAT or C is where the identity came from and proteins is this R group that's going to give amino acids their their identity um, the chain itself so remember I told you that these guys are put together by covalent bonds in this case the covalent bond is what we call a peptide bond and anytime you see that term peptide it really refers to something related to a protein and just like we saw in the nucleic acids the subunits are going to go together in a specific order so whereas the five prime end of one nucleotide attaches to the three prime end of another in this case the amino of one amino acid attaches to the carboxyl of another so just like we have five prime and three prime ends on the nucleic acids here we have what are called N for amino and C for carboxy that's the acidic and the amino groups um, termini and so this is creating a chain of amino acids that will also have a direction to it similar to the nucleic acids alright so here are the 20 amino acids and I'm just pulling this out of a probably an introductory book uh, not a whole lot here that you need to necessarily be worried about although I think at some point in your biology careers you do need to be able to recognize the amino acids not individually perhaps but at least as far as their properties go so remember we talked in a previous lecture about how the CH3s are very nonpolar so therefore they like to be very hydrophobic these would all be amino acids that you would find in in hydrophobic areas and we'll talk about some of the folding here in a second um, anything that has O's and N's in it this one does a little bit special but here's the OH, NH and these O's all of these guys like water so hence the, the polarity and they interact with water quite well and then these guys have full charges so a negative charge for an acid and a positive charge for a, a base and so these guys of course will participate a lot in ionic bonds within the proteins with respect to the chain it usually stays a single chain um, proteins obviously will interact with each other to make larger complexes but each protein itself is a single chain of amino acids and you can see that standard NCC 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 order to it with the N terminus on one end C terminus on the other and of course the R groups which give each one of those amino acids its own functions its own structure and depending on where they're located they may carry out those those functions in a specific way
Bose proteins are gonna fold up specifically based on the amino acids it has, or if they don't fold up spontaneously, or when they fold up spontaneously but in an incorrect manner, they may have to be helped out with a by a protein or actually it's a larger complex. This thing's about the size of a ribosome is going to, as a chaperone, what it does, it kind of here comes in, unfolds the protein from its incorrect structure and introduces the correct three-dimensional structure to it. And typically when it gets folded is when we start to call it a protein. The chemical properties of those R groups that I just mentioned, so whether it's an acid, whether it's a base, whether it's nonpolar, whether it's polar, all of those are ultimately responsible for how it folds. So if we are nonpolar, we're all going to try to work our way to the inside of the protein. If we are ionic, we want to interact with each other, so we will create those bonds. And if we're polar, then we're going to want to interact with the aqueous environment or maybe form hydrogen bonds with each other. So these, these intramolecular and intermolecular with other molecules are often going to play out within the context of the amino acid chain. All right, a couple of other terms here as proteins get folded and take on their function. Another term that will be important for us as we basically look at some of these proteins in their roles. Different proteins are going to have multiple functions to them. And oftentimes, these individual functions are going to be associated with what's called a domain. So it's a part of the protein that actually is, has a specific function, and then another domain would have a different function, and so on. These guys too, do tend to be organized in a linear fashion. So on the chain, if we had like a chain of 1,000 amino acids, let's say that the first 200 might be one domain, the next 300 is another domain, the next 500 is another domain. There are exceptions to that, but for the most part, the, the domain structure and the order of the, the amino acids in the chain tend to coincide. So here's a uh, protein called glyceraldehyde phosphate dehydrogenase. This one's really not um, too much of interest to us, although it does play a role in one of the pathways we'll talk about later. And what you'll see here is here's your N-terminus, there's your C-terminus. And you can see this structure here in blue would be one domain, and the structure here in orange is a different domain. So this guy has two functional parts to him. This side will do one thing, this side will do the other. The shape of a protein can change as part of its normal function, so a really big and important uh, concept that you need to be familiar with is not just the folding of a protein, but the fact that the folding can actually be regulated in a way that is meaningful, meaning that a lot of the proteins you and I are going to have give functions to or learn about their functions, the reality is, is that they actually go back and forth. This is what in chemistry we call an allosteric transition between an active form and an inactive form and which form a protein is in, whether it's active or inactive, is oftentimes controlled by either some signal or some event that's taking place. So you can already see where we're going with this, that a protein inside of a cell is going to do one thing if it encounters some signal, or it may do something else if it encounters or doesn't encounter that signal. So this is going to be a really key element to cells figuring out who they are and what they are and getting those events to match inside. So here would be a this is actually an enzyme, it's uh, not uh, one that we'll necessarily run into again, but uh, what I want you to kind of focus in on is here in the active site. Notice how the active site here is open in this phase, and then here it's closed over here. What's actually causing the change is this little star, and this is where the signal molecule is actually binding to this protein. So it binds it and opens it up so that it can now catalyze its reaction. And uh, over here, without the hormone or whatever that signal molecule is, the active site is closed. So what basically changes this back and forth is the binding of that molecule. A couple of other things here. Um, most proteins are actually gonna work alone I mean, that doesn't mean they're not part of a bigger group, but they 
are usually going to work alone as individual enzymes. Others may work as a large structural complex, what we might call an apparatus. And so these tend to be a little bit more variable as well because we can actually mix and match the components inside of these complexes depending on what's going on. So a couple of examples here. So you remember in the last session we talked about metabolic pathways and actually it was two sessions ago we talked about metabolic pathways and the enzyme hexokinase. This is hexokinase. So remember he binds to glucose and puts a phosphate on him. So glucose comes into the active site phosphate gets put on through the catalytic reaction and once he becomes glucose 6-phosphate he's going to come back out. So this enzyme, even though he's part of a metabolic pathway, he works by himself. This is the protein and another one that will show up later that we'll talk about, this is RNA polymerase. So he would be a RNA that actually, or an enzyme that makes RNAs from the genetic information and each one of these little uh, colored groups here is an individual protein that goes into the overall complex. So this would be what we call a, a multimeric complex or an RNA polymerase apparatus or a machine. Basically these have multiple components to them that carry out different roles and all of them work together towards one big function. So in this case making RNA. Okay, so proteins a lot of different uh, ones we'll, we'll encounter. They do a lot of different things, a lot of exciting things, and uh, we won't get a whole lot into the, the details, but just remember that based on my amino acids, I'm going to fold a certain way, and when I fold a certain way, I'm going to carry out my function, and by changing my shape, I can be controlled whether I'm active or inactive. All right, so next time we'll transition into some one of the more cellular concepts and uh, dig into some of the cell structure. See you then.